On today's episode, the thrilling conclusion to Dennis the Kindly Killer Nilsson. He's done some outrageous crimes at one house, and he's about to move into another to continue his gruesome path of destruction. All that and more today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. My name is Andy. Sitting across from me, as always, as always, is Mike. Mike. <laughs> hey, Mike. It's here. Mike. It's Mike. We're here. And this is Two Murder Morons. Yep. This is it. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. Hello and welcome. Hello. This is it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We are. So what are we doing? We're doing part two, man. Part two. Part two. Dennis yep. Nelson. It's craziness. Crazy. He's, a, he's, a, he's an unusual one. Yeah. There he is again. Check this dude out. Yep. Looks like Stephen King. Yep. He kind of yep. does. Still does. He does. He does. Yeah. And uh, so we should mention, if you're just tuning into this, this yeah. is part two. Part two. This is only half the story. If you want the whole background of this guy and the whole first set of murders at a completely different address, we will link part one. Part one with part two. Yeah. Yep. So down below. Down below. Here, so somewhere down here. check that one out first so you got some bearing about, about what we're talking about here. Yep. But uh, this here's Dennis. And this here... This is new house. Oh, dude, that's nice. That's a nice place. It looks nice, that's doesn't a it? Step up from the old place. So we've lost count of how many murders this guy committed in his first house. I'd say around sixteen or seventeen. We're, we're up there, yeah. But this is this here's the new place. So he's upstairs now. He is in the attic. Oh, so, so he's up there. He is all the way up top. Damn, that's a small spot in this uh, flat here in London. This hmm. is twenty three. Cranley Gardens. Okay. He won't be here long. Yeah. <laughs> so, unlike the previous house, with this house, he has no access to a garden. Oh. Darn and it. the garden is where he was burning the bodies. Correct. So, what's he going to do now? I have no idea. <laughs> and plus, he's on the, th he likes to put his bodies at the floorboards, which he's also unable to do because he's on the, he's in the attic. Right. And he is smart enough to realize. Probably not a good idea yeah. to put bodies basically in the ceiling of whoever's living underneath me. Yes. So he's smart. Yeah. Uh, as well, far as he's smart, but as far as that stuff yeah, goes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jack. So for almost two months, any acquaintances that Dennis encountered and lured to his flat were not assaulted in any manner. Oh. So he's almost like scared. So he, yeah, he he's afraid to do anything. He wants to murder, but he's like, where am I going to keep him? I can't put him in the can't floor. Can't burn can't him. Can't burn him. So he's trying to figure all that out. So he's meeting some guys here and hanging out with some people, but he's not assaulting anybody, which is a good thing. Yeah, it is. But he's going <laughs> to he's going to he's, he's going to lose the battle in his brain. Yeah, he's got to feed he's got to feed himself. He's got to feed that fire. Right. And this is going to intensify. He did attempt to strangle a 19 year old student named Paul Knobs on November 23rd, 1981, but stopped himself from completing the act. So I think it's because he's bad. What is he going to do? So Paul was drunk. I, I take it. Passed out probably. Yeah. I didn't realize what the fuck you went. Okay. Right. Yeah. So now we're in March 1982. Dennis encounters 23-year-old John Howlett while drinking in a pub near Leicester Square. Howlett was lured to Dennis's flat on the promise of continued drinking and of hanging course. out. Hanging out. Yeah. There... Both Dennis and Howlett drank as they watched a film before Howlett walked into Dennis's front room and fell asleep in his bed. Uh oh, it's kind yeah, of a common theme yeah, here. Ooh. Don't uh, fall asleep in that place, which was located in the front room now. Oh, now because yeah. it's a smaller flat, right, smaller flat. I'm thinking kind of more of a studio. Probably the bed's just kind of in the front room. Yeah. One hour later, uh, Dennis unsuccessfully attempted to wake Howlett up. Mm -hmm. then sat on the edge of the bed drinking rum as he stared at Howlett before deciding to kill him. Yeah, because it's just killing him. Right. His, his little brain is just going, going to town. 
following a ferocious struggle in which Howlett himself attempted to strangle Dennis, Dennis strangled Howlett into unconsciousness with an upholstery strap. Oh, yeah. Before returning to his living room, shaking from the stress of the struggle in which he had believed he would be overpowered. So Dennis later tells investigators he, he thought this was one. it. Yeah. He almost lost this fight. On three occasions over the following 10 minutes, Dennis unsuccessfully attempted to kill his victim after noting he had resumed breathing. So he's tried to kill him now four times, yeah. and the guy keeps breathing. Yep. So then he decides to fill his bathtub with water and drown him. Yeah, well, that's what you do. For over a week following Hallett's murder, Dennis's own neck bore the victim's finger impressions. So for a week, Dennis has bruises. Where he's ruined, yeah. Where he was being strangled. Yeah. So he's got to hide that yep, while he's going it. to work. Yep. In May 1982, but Dennis... He's, he's still working then. Still working that... Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Right. Probably still the, like the CEO or whatever that company. Yeah. Or whatever. Chief officer. Chief officer. Whatever they call whatever, it. Yeah. In May of 1982, Dennis encountered Carl Stodder, a 21-year-old gay man, as the young man drank at the Black Cat Pub in Camden. Okay. Dennis engaged Stodder in conversation, discovering he was depressed following a failed relationship. So this guy's in there drinking his old relationship. Yeah, he was gay. He's drinking blues away. Oh, I wonder if somebody did that one night. I was going to say, or, I think we've been being part of something like that once. Yeah, situation. So. Yeah. Yeah. Been there before. <laughs> hmm. After plying him with alcohol, um, Dennis invited Stodder over to his flat, assuring his guests he had no intention of sexual activity. Oh, okay. Hey. I know you're going through a breakup. Yeah, I don't want it. Yeah. I'm not trying to try anything with you. I just yeah. feel bad for you. Why don't you come back to my place? Just come back and we'll hang out. Just want to make sure you don't do anything stupid. Right. Yeah. Once at the flat, Stoddard consumed further alcohol before falling asleep on an open sleeping bag. On an open sleeping bag. Open sleeping bag. Here we go. That was set up just <laughs> waiting for him to fall asleep. In. Yep. He later awoke to find himself being strangled. With Dennis loudly whispering, stay still. Oh, yeah. That's what you do when you're getting strangled. In his, so he survives because it says, in his subsequent testimony at Dennis's trial, oh. Stoddard stated he initially believed Dennis was trying to free him from the zip of the sleeping bag. So you got to imagine he's drunk off his ass. Yeah. And he wakes up being strangled, but he thinks. He's trying to help him out of a yeah. sleeping bag situation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't realize he's being strangled. He then vaguely recalled hearing water running before realizing he was immersed in the water and that Dennis was attempting to drown him. So he's put this dude in a sleeping bag and zipped him up in it so he can't, yeah, so he can't reach do or anything. Yeah, and move. he's holding him underwater. After briefly succeeding in raising his head above the water, Stoddard gasped the words, no more, please, no more, to Dennis. And then Dennis again submerged Stoddard's head beneath the water. <laughs> yeah, of course. So Dennis didn't care. No, not at that point. Dennis makes the mistake of believing he had killed Stoddard. Okay. Okay. So Dennis seats the youth in the armchair. So he's going back to all the other victims. He thinks he's got a dead body. So he's going to prop the dead body up in the chair to hang out with him. Yep. Um, he then noted that a, a mongrel dog that Dennis had apparently at this period of time named bleep bleep. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, began licking Stoddard's face. That's when Dennis realized that Stoddard was still barely alive. He rubbed Stoddard's limbs and heart to increase circulation, covered the use body in blankets, then laid him upon his bed. So he's like almost trying to revive him at this yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. When Stoddard regained consciousness, Dennis embraced him. He then explained to Stoddard he had almost strangled himself on the zip of the sleeping bag and that he had resuscitated him. So he's trying to tell him the story. Dude, you you were the sleeping bag was strangling you and I saved you. <laughs> well, why am I wet, though? <laughs> why was I in a bathtub? Yeah, what happened there? I guess Dennis is assuming that he doesn't remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something. Yeah. Over the following two days, Stoddard repeatedly lapsed in and out of consciousness for two days. He's going in and out of consciousness. When Stoddard had regained enough strength to question Dennis as to his recollection, recollections of being strangled and immersed in cold water, Dennis explained he had became, become caught in the zip of a sleeping bag following a nightmare. 
Okay. And that he had placed him in the cold water to shock him out of the nightmare. Yeah. So that's the excuse for being in the bathtub. Okay, yeah, I tried to wake you, but you wouldn't wake up, so I threw you in the bathtub. Dennis then led Stoddard to a nearby railway station where he informed the young man he hoped they might meet again before he said farewell to him. Mm -hmm. So he let this dude go. Mistake. Yeah. But kind of weird that he... I don't know if he just was like, I'm not going to be able to kill this dude. He won't he die. Probably, yeah, it may be it. So I'll just come up with a good excuse and get rid of, like, yeah. drive him to the train station, yeah. I guess. Maybe he won't remember. And not the Yellowstone kind of drive to the train. He tried yeah, to yeah, drive. Yeah, 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 yeah. An actual train station. Right. Yeah. I'm sure they don't have that gap there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Three months after Dennis's June 1982 promotion to the position of executive officer in his employment, he encountered a 27-year-old named Graham Allen attempting to hail a taxi in Shaftesbury Avenue. Okay. Allen accepted Dennis's offer to accompany him to Cranley Gardens for a meal. Oh, all right. I have never had a stranger come up to me and be no, been like, not you want to come to my house for dinner? Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say no, but yeah. I guess this is a different time in a different place. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't, mm. I've never had some stranger. Yeah. I've talked to strangers in a bar. Right, but you don't invite him back to your... No. Well, well, <laughs> let's go back. Maybe a well, female. Yeah, but, yeah, it's a little different. Not a different, different situation. Totally, yeah. Yeah. So as had been the case with several previous victims, Dennis stated he could not recall the precise moment he had strangled Alan, but recalled approaching him as he sat eating an omelet with the full intention of murdering him. Dude, I bet he could recall. I bet he's just being stupid. Do you think so? Or do you yeah. think there's just so many victims he can't piece together which uh, happened what way? Because these guys remember. They, they they always remember. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I bet he remembers. He's just not. Coming off of everything? Yeah. Yeah. I could, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I may be wrong, but I just. These guys usually take a little. I mean, these are. They're, tr they're trophies for one. Right. You know, I mean, th there's a lot that goes into this, and there's a lot of, I mean, feeling that goes into it. So I think he remembers who they are. Yeah. And m much more detail than he's given up. Yeah. Yeah. So Dennis keeps Alan's body in his bathtub for a total of three days. Okay. Before Dennis began the task of dissecting his body on the kitchen floor. Okay. Dennis is again known to have informed his employers that he was ill and unable to attend work from October 9th, 1982. Likely in order that he could complete the dissection. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. On January 26th, 1983, Dennis killed his final victim, 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. So Sinclair was last seen by acquaintances in the company of Dennis walking in the direction of a tube station, subway station. Yeah. Once at Dennis's flat, Sinclair fell asleep in a drug and alcohol. We cannot talk tonight. Sinclair fell asleep in a drug and alcohol induced stupor in an armchair as Dennis sat listening to the rock opera Tommy. Okay. We all know Tommy. We know Tommy. Yeah, but it's better than Emerson Lake and Palmer. Do you want to do a little rendition of a Tommy song? No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. Uh, Dennis approached Sinclair, knelt before him, and said to himself, Oh, Stephen, here I go again. Like he's unstoppable. Yeah. Like, oh, gotta hate to do this, but you gotta do it. Because in my brain says I gotta do it. Here I go again. Yeah. It's wrong, but it's got I gotta do it. Yeah. He then strangled Sinclair with a ligature constructed with a necktie and rope. Following his unusual ritual of bathing the body. Dennis laid Sinclair's body on his bed, applied talcum pow powder to the body, then arranged three mirrors around the bed before lying naked alongside the dead man. Because he wants to see it. Right. Yeah. So just envision this scene of a bed with a mirror on three sides. There's a dead body with talcum powder all over it, and he's Tommy. snuggled up next to it. Yeah. Several hours later, he turned Stephen's head towards him, before kissing his body on the forehead and saying, good night, Stephen. He is. Yeah. He's gone. Mentally. Yeah, he's in a different world. Dennis then fell asleep alongside the body. As had been the case with both Howlett and Allen, 
Sinclair's body was subsequently dissected with various dismembered parts wrapped in plastic bags and stored in either a wardrobe, a tea chest, or within a drawer located beneath the bathtub. The bags used to seal Sinclair's remains were sealed with the same bandages uh, that Dennis had found on Sinclair's wrists. Okay. Dennis attempted to dispose of the flesh, internal organs, and smaller bones of all three victims killed at Cranley Gardens by flushing their dissected remains down the toilet. Okay, stop there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. dude, seriously. I mean, what thought? What in his little brain thought he could actually flush that kind of stuff down the toilet? I mean, he's never taken a big poop. What? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, if you, I mean, if you cut it up small enough. I mean, if we're talking finger bones and just small pieces of flesh, I see where he's going. He can't burn them anymore. Well, I know he can't burn them. He but, can't hang on to them under the floorboards. No, but he's got them in bags. He could at least, I mean, you'd think he'd at least you take them to a dumpster. But yeah. flushed him down the toilet. Yeah, um, and three, three, three yeah. full bodies. Yeah. He's trying to flush down the toilet. Yeah, that's a lot down the pipe. So apparently, he had done this also at Melrose Avenue with a few of the victims. Oh, okay, I'm guessing probably the ones before he started burning them. Like maybe he was afraid to go outside to burn the body parts because he'd be or, caught. Or maybe he did after maybe certain parts didn't burn and he just. And he flushed it, crushed them, and flushed them down. Yeah. Well. He also boiled the heads, hands, and feet Ugh. to remove the flesh off these sections of the victims' bodies. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. To get them to flush down the toilet, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Mm. I mean, can you think? I mean, yeah. Of a worse, like talk about really shitting on somebody oh, of yeah. another you, human you, being. You've dismembered them, and you're putting their head on a on a on the crock pot on the on the pot. A cat, you know, and you're melting their face off. I mean, to me, this is worse than throwing someone in a dumpster mm -hmm. or in a landfill. Yeah. Like you are flushing somebody down the toilet. Mm -hmm. It's insane to me. Yeah, but they're not at, at that point. When he gets to that point, he he doesn't even think of them anymore. The fascinations are over with. They they don't mean anything. They're nothing but trash oh, to him. Yeah, to him, they're just trash. Yeah, at that point that he just has to get rid of so he doesn't get caught yeah. and he can continue. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. There's no care for him like there was two days prior. Right. He no longer loves them. Yeah. On February 4th, 1983, Dennis himself wrote a letter of complaint to the estate agents complaining that the drains at Cranley Gardens were blocked. I wonder why. Okay. Here's what I... Why would you write? He has made so many... I say smart moves, but as a criminal, yeah, he's made very good decisions to remain undiscovered. Correct. Right? Especially once he moves into this attic. He knows he can't burn them, but he knows he can't put them on the floor. You know, he's kind of as smart as he can be about not being caught. You just flushed three human bodies down your toilet. Yeah. The toilet's now clogged, and you complain to the landlord that they need to come fix the clock. Doors. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God. Hello. Uh, yeah. He said in the letter that the situation for both himself and the other tenants of the property was intolerable. Mm hmm. Wonder why. The following day, what a dumbass. Right. Jesus. The following day, he refused to allow an acquaintance of his to enter the property. The reason being. In real life, he had begun to dismember Sinclair's body on the floor of his kitchen. Oh, okay. So, like... He's busy still. How crazy... Like, I just think of, like, these people in these stories. Like, you got this but this acquaintance buddy, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I'm going to stop by and visit him. You knock on the door. He cracks the door. Hey, man, I'm not feeling well. or I can't... Hand, sorry. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Yeah. See you later. Shut the door. Then you find out later that the reason you weren't let in is there was a body on the yeah, floor. Yeah, he was him up. Like, that's nuts to me. Yeah, because then if you, th you think about it, you're like, well, shit, that could have been me. Right, exactly. Crap. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So Dennis's murders at Cranley Gardens were first discovered by a dino rod employee. Plumbing. Okay. Uh, like, ro I'm thinking that's Rotor like Rotor Rooter. Okay, yeah. yeah. His name is Michael Catran. Okay. Okay. He responded to the plumbing complaints 
made by Dennis. Yeah. And at this point, other tenants of Cranley Gardens. Okay. So there are other people complaining. I should have let the other people complain and just kept his mouth shut. Or did he know the others were complaining? So he thought it would look weird if he was the one that didn't once they discover what true. it is. So he's. Yeah, true. Good point. You know, Who knows? So this guy responds on February 8th, 1983 to this complaint. Opening a drain cover at the side of the house, Katran discovered the drain was packed with a flesh-like substance and numerous small bones of unknown origin, which has got to be weird for him. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Katran reported his discoveries um, and suspicions to his supervisor, Gary Wheeler. As Katran had arrived at the property at dusk, he and Wheeler agreed to postpone further investigation into the blockage until the following morning. So, I get it. They're outside. It gets dark. Yeah, it's getting dark. Can't really see what the hell's going on. And you don't want to deal with shit at night. Prior to leaving the property, Dennis and fellow tenant Jim Alcock convened with Katran to discuss the source of the substance. So, Dennis is right there. And this plumber's like, look at this crap I'm pulling out of this drain. Upon hearing Katran exclaim how similar the substance was in appearance to human flesh, Dennis replied, quote, it looks to me like someone's been flushing down their Kentucky fried chicken. Which, <laughs> which one, I think it's hysterical to have Kentucky fried chicken in London. Well, I think they, well, they probably do. But I get it. He's almost backpedaling now. Oh, it's yeah. an excuse. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It looks like someone flushed well, a chicken down their drain. Yeah, their chicken... At 7.30 in the morning the following day, Katrina Wheeler returned to Cranley Gardens, by which time the drain had been cleared. Oh. No problem now. Stuff went down, finally. Maybe Dennis should have thought of this and took, did it before filing yeah, a complaint. Yeah, before filing a complaint. This aroused suspicions of both men. Well, no shit. Wonder <laughs> why. Yeah. We yeah. had bones here yesterday. And now everything's nothing. gone. Yeah. yeah. Which one of these guys was involved? Katran discovers some scraps of flesh and four bones and a pipe leading from the drain, which linked to the top flat of the house. So he is now in investigative mode, and he yeah. finds it. Where does this pipe? Oh, it About goes up goes to up that to attic it. flat. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. To both Katran and Wheeler, the bones looked as if they originated from a human hand. Can you imagine being this plumber, these no. plumbers, no. God, and no. being like, what do you think that is, and having to be like, Mike? Yeah. I think that's a damn human finger, dude. Yeah. Well, like, what, what, what gives that away? Well, because it's got a nail on it. <laughs> it's a goddamn fingernail. <laughs> Shit. I didn't know KFC. But, yeah. Man, this KFC yeah. in our town's really got some problems. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> There's fingernails yeah, in our food. Holy crap. But, oh, man. Um, mm. Obviously, <laughs> both men immediately call the police. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. At that Who, point. Upon closer inspection, discovered further small bones and scraps of what looked to be the naked eye like either human or animal flesh in the same pipe. Eye like flesh. So, so not a whole eye, just but, the flesh. But they pull like a chunk of something that to them they're like, is this a part of an eyeball? Hmm. Uh, these remains were taken to the mortuary at Hornsey where pathologist David Bowen advised police that the remains were, in fact, human. Okay? And that one particular piece of flesh, he concluded, had been from a human neck bone um, and that it bore a ligature mark. So they actually found a bone. Bone. He said, this is from someone's neck, and there's a ligature mark in it, like from someone has been strangled. He's deducing from all this. Wow. So upon learning from fellow tenants that the top floor flat from where the human remains had been flushed belonged to Dennis, Detective Chief Inspector Peter J. and two colleagues opted to wait outside the house until Dennis returned home from work. When Dennis returned home, Detective J. introduced himself and his colleagues, explained they had come to inquire about the blockage in the drains from his flat. Okay. Dennis asked why the police were interested in his drains and also whether or not the two officers present with Jay were health inspectors. Oh. In response, Jay informed Dennis that the other two were also police officers and requested access to his flat to discuss the matter further. The three officers followed Dennis into his flat. So he didn't just go like, you got a warrant? No. He, I think he's, I think he's realizing he's caught at this point. Well, but I think he's trying to at least delay a little bit. I mean, most, I mean, that happened here. No, that's true. Everybody's getting the first thing it would be like, you got a warrant? 
Yeah, I mean, they may sit there and, and get a warrant in 15 minutes, but... Yeah. I don't know what... I don't know how the government works over there. I'm right. sure it's pretty different. But, yeah, know. that's true. So the three officers followed Dennis into his flat, where they immediately noted the odor of rotting flesh. I was going to say, if, they're, if they've been on the department long enough, they got to know. They know. They know that smell. <laughs> Dennis questioned further as to why the police were interested in his drains. I'm and I'm envisioning this as he's nervous. Oh yeah. Yeah. Why? Why you? Why? What's with the drain? Why you want to look in the yeah, drain? Yeah. What's up with the drain? Which to me I think causes quite a bit of suspicion. But uh, well, yeah, it's kind of like when the cops go into someone's house and they're like, "Well, come on inside. Just don't look in that closet." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Don't go to the bathroom, please. Like right. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't go in that room back there. Yeah. Stay out of that room. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the police informed Dennis that the blockage had been caused by human remains. They tell him straight up, dude, it's yeah, human yeah. remains in, in the drain leading from your apartment. He faked shock and be bewilderment. Oh, my gosh. Really? Yeah. And and went into this whole good grief, how awful yeah. response. Yeah, of course, right? like most normal people would do. At which point, I like this detective. Immediately, the detective sa says to Dennis, don't mess about. Where's the rest of the body? Don't mess about. There yeah. you go. Well, that's, you know. Yeah. Quit f***ing around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In to the point. Let's America. Go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's shut immediately this whole, I don't buy this. Yeah, shut the f*** up. Let's, let, yeah, tell us where the body is. It came from your drain. Where's the rest of the damn body? Dude? Yeah. Like, quit playing with us. Yeah, what'd you do? Dennis reportedly responded calmly, admitting that the remainder of the body could be found in two plastic bags in a nearby wardrobe. Damn. From which Detective Jay and his colleagues noted the overpowering smell of decomposition from the wardrobe. The officers did not open the cupboard, but asked Dennis whether there were any other body parts to be found. To which Dennis replied, uh, kind of a long story. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh God, this guy's an idiot. Mm. <laughs> Can you imagine being that detective and being like, okay. Yeah, I is know. it one person or are we talking multiple people? And the person's like, "Well, you gotta you got some hours to talk." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got we're gonna be here a while. So he said, "It's a long story. It goes back a long time." You break out that tape recorder. I will tell you everything. I yeah. want to get it off my chest, but not here at the police station. I think he was done. He was done. Like I think he. I think he. Had, I think he. I think he. I think he filled himself to a point that. He just couldn't do anymore. I think he, he could. I mean, I think he was done. Yeah. And he's caught. I mean, at that yeah. point. Yeah. I think he satisfied his hunger. When the cops have found the body in your drain and they're like, dude, we're not messing around. Tell us what's up. Yeah. So you he's just going to come clean. May as well if I'm just, done. And yeah. I'm done anyway. So he was then arrested and cautioned on suspicion of murder before being taken to Hornsey Police Station. Yeah, what an idiot. While en route to the police station, Dennis was asked whether the remains in his flat belonged to one person or two. <laughs> <laughs> if they only knew yeah. that the questions yeah. they were asking were so dumb. <laughs> yes. Staring out of the window of the police car in the back, he replies, 15 or 16 since 1978. No, there's more than that. That evening, Detective Superintendent Chambers accompanied Detective Jay at Bowen to Cramley Gardens, where the plastic bags were removed from the wardrobe and taken to the mortuary. One bag was found to contain two dissected torsos, mm. one of which had been vertically dissected, and a oh. shopping bag containing various internal organs. Vertically? Vertically dissected. Like an animal. Like, I think. Yeah. Maybe. The second bag contained a human skull, almost completely devoid of flesh, a severed head, and a torso with arms attached, but hands missing. Both heads were found to have been subjected to moist heat. So the boiling. Boiling. Yep. In an in yeah, the, the hands we know where they went. They went, yeah. yeah they the they found them in the drain. Yeah, they're down the drain. Yeah. In an interview conducted on February 10th, Dennis confessed there were further human remains stowed in a tea chest in his living room, with other remains inside an upturned drawer in his bathroom. Which I'm like, they didn't find this during the first search. Yeah, exactly. They were like, all right, we found the two yeah, bags. We found two bags. And he's like, oh, but the tea chest and the drawer, you got to look there too. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll yeah. go back. What, what kind of what kind of search of the property was this? Well, they may have been restricted to only 
Because he said the wardrobe. wardrobe I, yeah, they I, made I don't know what their laws are like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the dismembered body parts were the bodies of three men in those locations. Jeez. All of whom he had killed by strangulation, usually with a necktie. Oh, correct. One victim he could not name. He, he claimed he just didn't know who it was. Another he knew only as John the Guardsman. John and, the Guardsman. And the third he identified as Stephen Sinclair. Okay. Okay. He also stated that beginning in December 1978, he had killed 12 or 13 men at his former address, 195 Melrose Avenue. So really, he could have just acted like yeah. this was it. I mean, he's done for it. Oh, yeah, 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 either way. But can you imagine being the cop in that interview room and being like, oh, but there's a second house <laughs> you guys should probably go to? Yeah. Because 12 or 13 are there. Wow. Yeah. Dennis also admitted to having unsuccessfully attempted to kill approximately seven other people who had either escaped or on one occasion had been at the brink of death, but had been revived and allowed to leave his residence. Which we knew that was. Yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. A further search for additional remains at Cranley Gardens on February 10th revealed the lower section of a torso and two legs stowed in a bag in the bathroom. Okay. A skull, a sec- another section of torso, and various bones in the tea chest. Because you can't flush that stuff down the drain. That's too... I mean, you got to, like, really smash yeah, that. grind that up. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The same day, Dennis accompanied police to Mel. They take him back to the apartment. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. They he takes him to Melrose Avenue, the first house. I think God didn't have a garbage disposal. Where I right? Hmm. Maybe he did. Uh, I don't, I don't know. that big back then. Um. So he takes them to the first house, Melrose, where he indicated the three locations in the rear garden where he had burned the remains of his victims. So he takes them in the yard. Oh, right had a there. fire there. Had a fire there. Yep. Fire here. And I sewed them all here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so under English law, this is interesting. Okay. The police had 48 hours in which to charge Dennis or release him. Oh. Okay. Upon learning. Right. Which, which is a whole, I don't know if you hear me say earlier, like they arrested him on caution of murder. Correct. I think that's what it's like saying suspicion. Suspicion. So they got 48 hours to charge him or they got to let him go. I think they got enough. I think they had enough of the first house. Yeah. Assembling the remains of the victims killed at Granley Gardens on the f- uh, on the floor of Hornsley Mortuary. So they lay out all these parts. <laughs> yeah. Professor Bowen was able to confirm the fingerprints on one body match those on police files of Sinclair. Okay. So they identify this hand or finger or whatever it was. Long Sinclair. To Sinclair. Okay. At 5.40 p.m. on February 11th, Dennis was charged with Sinclair's murder. And a statement revealing this was uh, revealing this was released to the press. So this is the first time the press is hearing anything. Okay, you know, but at least they got a charge on him, right? So they're holding him. Formal questioning of Dennis began the same evening with Dennis agreeing to be represented by a solicitor, um, lawyer, right? Yeah, um, which earlier he declined. So earlier when he made all these statements, they had asked him if he wanted a lawyer, and I guess he said no. But now that it's formal, he's charged. Formal, yeah. He, okay, I'll charged. take a lawyer. Yeah. Police interviewed Dennis on 16 separate occasions over the following days. Yeah, I wonder why. In interviews which totaled over 30 hours. Jeez. There's a lot of story there, though. Yeah, there I is. Mean, that's, Are you talking... Yeah. You're talking a lot of... A lot, yeah. Uh, that's a lot of murders. That he, and if he's openly describing them, that's, yeah, yeah. that's some time. It takes time, yeah. Mm. Dennis was adamant that he was uncertain as to why he had killed, simply saying, quote, I'm hoping you will tell me that. So he doesn't know why. I don't think he does. No, I don't think he knows what's wrong. With and him. I think at this point, now that he's caught and they're saying, why did you do this? He's saying, well, you're the professionals. I hope you'll tell me why yeah, I did this tell me crazy doing shit. This shit. Um, when he was asked his motive for the murders, um, he was adamant that the decision to kill was not made until moments before the act of murder. So okay. he's adamant, like, I wasn't planning. He probably wasn't. He wasn't. He met these people, wanted to befriend, befriend them, got them back to the apartment, got them drinking. And I think that's when he's like, all right. Well, he realizes he wants to keep them. Right. The only way that he's going to be able to keep them is he's going to have to kill them. Right. He said most of the victims had died by strangulation. On several occasions, he had drowned the victims once they had been strangled in unconsciousness. Just to make sure. Once the victim had been killed, he typically bathed the victim's body, shaved any hair from the torso. Oh, so he likes fresh. 
Right. So he not only bathed, he's shaving the torso yeah, to conform it to his physical yes, ideal, yes. what he's into. Correct. Then applied makeup to any obvious blemishes on the skin. So if these people the had a... Yeah, if they have the ligature marks. Right, or there's a bruise or something old, whatever it yeah. is, he put makeup to make them look... Yep, the way he wanted Perfect. Yeah. The body was usually dressed in socks and underpants before Dennis draped the victims around him as he talked to the corpse. Could you imagine walking in on that? <laughs> uh, no. God. I can't. Like, you're one of his buddies? You pop over to see him, and you just walk in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's got to come back another day. And he's, he's there yeah. like, it's my buddy. Yeah, none of a move. Right. You know, in the smell. Oh, God. I don't think he had many buddies, Mike. I don't think so either. <laughs> yeah, they're all dead. So with most victims, Dennis masturbated as he stood alongside or knelt above the body. Mm. And Dennis confessed to having occasionally engaged in actual sex with his victims' corpses. But repeatedly stressed to investigators he had never actually penetrated his victims. So, I don't know how that works, but that's this is what he's claiming. So did he just masturbate? That's it. Well, it says he, that he he claimed to have sex with occasionally him. engaged in sex with his victims' bodies, but repeatedly stressed to investigators he'd never actually penetrate. So maybe just like rubbing himself on them. I don't just kind of curt. Maybe like going in between the butt cheeks, but not going in. Something I don't know. I, I don't know, dude. I, I'm just <laughs> I don't know. No clue. He explained that his victims were quote too perfect and beautiful for the pathetic ritual of commonplace sex. Oh, okay. They were they putting them on a pedestal, man. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Oh, yeah. All the victims' personal possessions were destroyed following the ritual of bathing their bodies in an effort to obliterate their identity. So he didn't save anything? No. Okay. Well, except them. Them. As long as So that could. was his trophy, was them. Right. Um, he described the bodies as a prop in his fantasies. Okay. Yep. In several instances, he talked to the victim's body as it remained seated in a chair or prone on his bed. So he's having conversations with mm -hmm. the bodies. And he recalled being emotional as he marveled at the beauty of their bodies. So he would literally stand there and cry because he thought the body was so beautiful there. Yeah. There. yeah. With reference to one victim, Kenneth Ochtenden, remember him? Yep. Canada. Yes. Nice. Dennis noted that Octanton's body and skin were very beautiful, adding that the sight almost brought me to tears. Hmm. Another un unidentified victim had been so emaciated, I'm sorry, so emaciated that he had simply been discarded under the floorboards. So basically, he's saying one victim he didn't do any of this ritual with because he was so yeah. skinny, it hmm. didn't fit his ideal of beauty. So he killed him, but he just put him on. Yeah, he didn't do yeah, all the other yeah, stuff. Yeah. The bodies of the victims at his previous address were kept for as long as decom decomposition would allow. So, like I said, he, he, he held on as yeah. long as he possibly could. Yeah. Um, upon noting any major signs of decomposition in a body, Dennis stowed it beneath the floor floorboards. Yep. If a body did not display any signs of decomposition, he occasionally alternately stowed it beneath the floorboards and retrieved it before again masturbating as he stood over or lay alongside the body. So this is that he would open up those floorboards yeah. and look at the victims. Well, that one still looks still pretty looks okay. Yeah, still good. Bring them up and do everything yeah. all over again. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, um, he would apply makeup to cover up the decomposition yes. areas. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. When question as to why the heads found at Cranley Gardens have been subject to moist heat, Dennis stated that he had frequently boiled the heads of his victims in a large cooking pot on his stove so that the internal contents evaporated, thus removing the need to dispose of the brain and flesh. So all that was left over was the skull. Well, plus it cut down on his maggot problem. Exactly. E exactly. Yep. The torsos and limbs of three victims killed at this address were dissected within about one week of the murder before being wrapped in plastic and stowed in three locations he had indicated to police. The internal organs and smaller bones he flushed down the toilet. Okay. So the stuff that fit where he thought would fit, he flushed. Yeah. And the others he's keeping. But Matt, that may, that rusty cat may have been the trophy. Mm-hmm. Just, he just couldn't put it in the floorboard, so 
I'll cut them up, and I'll keep them that way. Right. Um, this practice of flushing what he could down the toilet, which led to his arrest, had been the only method he could consider to dispose of the internal organs and soft tissue. Because unlike Melrose Avenue, he had no exclusive use of the garden on the property. Correct. So that's the whole thing. He yeah. didn't want to do the bonfires because he thought he'd get caught. Mm-hmm. At Melrose Avenue, Dennis typically retained the victim's bodies for a much longer period of time. Because he could. Before disposing of the well, remains. Because he could. He could. He could, yeah, yeah. get away with it. Um, he kept three or four bodies stowed beneath the floorboards before he just dissected the remains. So I, th- I'm, I'm feeling like he'd have three or four, and as soon as one of those he would have to burn, that's when the next – well, he needs to yeah, yeah. replace it, basically. Yep. Um, so – he stowed them beneath the floorboards before he dissected the remains. He wrapped them inside plastic bags um, and put them either under the floorboards or in two instances placed inside suitcases, which had been left at the property by a wow. previous tenant. He must have had to really do some stuff. And- yeah. The remains stowed inside the suitcases, those of Ockenden and Duffy, were placed inside a shed in the rear garden and were disposed of upon the second bonfire that Dennis had at Melrose Avenue. Okay. Other dissected remains, minus the internal organs, were returned beneath the floorboards or placed upon a bonfire he had constructed in the garden. Dennis confirmed that on four occasions he had removed the accumulated bodies from beneath the floorboards and dissected the remains. And on three of these occasions, he had then disposed of the accumulated remains upon a bonfire. On more than one occasion, he had removed the internal organs from the victims and placed them in bags, which he then typically dumped behind a fence to be eaten by wildlife. Yeah, that's easy to dispose of. All the bodies of the victims killed at Melrose Avenue were dismembered after several weeks or months. Um, Dennis recalled that the putrefaction of these victims' bodies made this task exceedingly vile. Yeah, yeah. someone that's been dead for months yeah. and you're cutting them open, that's going to be pretty vile. Yeah, it ain't even, not even months. Couple weeks. Oh, yeah. Couple days. Yeah. Even, they, yeah. You know, like, been on the, t- t- the time of the year. So Dennis recalled having to fortify his nerves with whiskey and having to grab handfuls of salt with which to brush aside maggots from the remains. Oh, yeah. Often he vomited as he dissected the bodies before mm-hmm. wrapping the dismembered limbs inside plastic bags. Nonetheless, Immediately prior to his dissecting the victim's bodies, Dennis masturbated as he knelt alongside the corpse. Mm. Mm. As he's throw, as he just got done throwing up. He said he did this. It was his way of a symbolic gesture of saying goodbye to his victims. <laughs> oh, man. That was his way. That's some sick shit. Yeah. That's how you say goodbye. That's how you say goodbye. To a three-month-old corpse. Yeah. Mm. When questioned as to whether he had any remorse for his crimes, Mike, what do you think? You think he had any remorse? I don't know. You don't think so at all? Well, I think in a way he did. He may not admit it, but I think he did. So he replied, quote, I wished I could stop, but I couldn't. That's remorse. I had no other thrill or happiness than doing this. Mm -hmm. He also emphasized that he took no pleasure from the act of killing but, quote, worship the art and the act of death. There's a turn on for him. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. So February 11th, 1983, Dennis is officially charged with the murder of Stephen Sinclair. He's transferred to HMP Brixton to be held on uh, remand until his trial. So he's held in prison until trial. According to Dennis, upon being transferred to Brixton prison to wait trial, his mood was one of resignation and relief. I can understand it's over. I can see it's over. Yeah, yeah. They've caught me. I'm done. With the belief, his belief being that he would be viewed in accordance with law as innocent until proven guilty. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. He objected to wearing a prison uniform. Okay. Because yeah. I'm innocent until yeah, I'm proven I'm guilty. Until proven guilty. Uh, in protest at having to wear a prison uniform and what he interpreted to be breaches of prison rules, Dennis threatened to protest against his remand conditions by refusing to wear any clothes. Oh, okay. As a result of this threat, he was not allowed to leave his cell. So they basically put him down into 
yeah, lockdown. Yeah, there you go. We'll yeah. show you. On August 1st, Dennis threw the contents of his chamber pot out of his cell. So his pooping and yeah. peeing pot. Yeah. Hitting several prison officials with it. This incident that, that, resulted in Dennis being found guilty on August 9th of assaulting prison officers and subsequently spending 56 days in solitary confinement. Uh, mm. On May 26, Dennis was committed to stand trial at the Old Bailey on five counts of murder and two of attempted murder. A sixth murder charge would be added later. Yeah, I'm really surprised that they didn't do some kind of psychological. Yeah. I mean, because he is, he's crazy. There's something. I mean, he's. Yeah, there's something. There's clearly something. going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's got, yeah. So throughout his committal hearing, he was represented by a solicitor, an attorney named Ronald Moss, whom he had previously dismissed as his legal representative before Moss was reappointed to the role after Dennis had complained to magistrates he had been afforded no facilities with which he could mount his own defense. So he's a public defender, basically, probably. Yeah. Moss was to remain Dennis's legal representation until July 1983, when Dennis, again expressing his intention to defend himself, discharged him. Oh, he wants to defend himself. Until August 5th, when Dennis once again reappointed Moss. So he's going back and forth on the... Mm -hmm. He sounds a little bit like, what's his well, name trying, he just had? Well, he's, he's trying to prolong it. You think so? I think so. Or you think he's just a nutbag? That, well, he's a nutbag, but I think he's trying to... I think he's playing a game. It's a game. Yeah. Prolong his trial. Initially, Dennis intended to plead guilty to each charge of murder at his upcoming trial. With Dennis's full consent, Moss had fully prepared his defense. Five weeks before his trial, Dennis again dismissed Moss and opted instead to be represented by Ralph Hames. No. Oh. Upon whose advice, Dennis agreed to plead not guilty by diminished responsibility. So, I'm thinking that's like insanity. Yeah. Would be mine. Yeah, yeah. Dennis is brought to trial on October 24th, 1983, charged with six counts of murder now and two of attempted murder. He was tried at the Old Bailey, which this is a... That's the Old Bailey. That's the Old Bailey Where courthouse right there. Uh, been and, since, God, I think he's been around for... <laughs> probably a couple hundred years, yeah. if not longer. Um, his trial was held before Mr. Justice Croom Johnson, and he pleaded not guilty on all charges. Okay. Because he, well, he was told to. Yeah. The primary dispute between the prosecuting attorneys and defense counsel was not whether Dennis had killed the victims, but his state of mind before and during the killings. Mm -hmm. The prosecution counsel, Alan Green, argued that Dennis was sane, in full control of his actions, and had killed with premeditation. The defense counsel argued that Dennis suffered from diminished responsibility, rendering him incapable of forming the intention to commit murder, and should therefore be convicted only of manslaughter. Of manslaughter. <laughs> Thinking all the heinous, crazy-ass crimes. Yeah. Manslaughter. But? But if he's crazy... But, yeah, you gotta forget, you gotta get, you gotta get it proven that he's crazy. Right. Uh, the prosecution opened the case for the Crown by describing the events of February 1983, leading to the identification of human remains in the drains at Cranley Gardens. And Dennis's subsequent arrest... The discovery of three dismembered bodies in his property, his detailed confession, his leading investigators to charred bone fragments of 12 further victims killed at Melrose Avenue, and the efforts he had taken to conceal his crimes. In a tactful reference to the primary dispute between opposing counsel at the trial, Green closed his opening speech with an answer Dennis had given to police in response to a question as to whether he needed to kill. Quote, at the precise moment of the act of murder, I believe I am right in doing the act. So that's a quote from Dennis. So he gave yeah, yeah, yeah. To counteract this argument, Green added, the Crown says that even if there was mental abnormality, that was not sufficient to diminish substantially his responsibility for these killings. Okay. This is a well-spoken guy. Yeah. It's yeah, good, yeah, yeah. good argument here. The first witness to testify for the prosecution was Douglas Stewart, who testified that in November. <laughs> well, you just like that name? No, just yeah. I'm thinking of other people. Gotcha. He testified in November 1980 that he had fallen asleep in a chair in Dennis's flat, yeah. only to wake to find his ankles bound to a chair and Dennis strangling him with a tie as he pressured his knee into his chest. Yeah. 
successfully overpowering Dennis, Stewart testified that Dennis had then shouted, take my money. <laughs> this, the prosecution attested, reflected Dennis's rational, cool presence of mind. Yeah. And that he hoped to be overheard by other tenants. So he's, Thinking he's being robbed. Right. So yeah. he can play victim later on. Yeah. Upon leaving Dennis's residence, Stewart had reported the attack to police, who in turn questioned Dennis. Noting conflicting details and accounts given by both men, police had dismissed the incident as a lover's quarrel. Yep, that's all you can do. Upon cross-examination, the defense counsel sought to undermine Stewart's credibility, pointing to minor inconsistencies in the testimony. The fact that he had consumed so much alcohol on the night in question, yeah. and suggesting his memory had been selectively magnified as he had previously sold his story to the press. Which that's never good. No, it's not. Someone still, you know, before you even testify, yep. you sell your story yep. to the press. They, they're going to use that every time. Oh, yeah. On October 25th, the court heard testimony from two further men who had survived attempts by Dennis to strangle them. The first of these, Paul Nobbs, provided testimony, which the prosecution asserted was evidence of Dennis's self control and ability to refrain from homicidal impulses. Mm hmm. A university student, Nobbs, testified that he accompanied Dennis to Cranley Gardens for alcohol and sex and woke in the early morning hours with a terrible headache. Upon washing his face in Dennis's bathroom, as Nobbs noticed uh, his eyes were bloodshot and his face completely red, Dennis had exclaimed, God, you look bloody awful. Dennis then advised the youth to see a doctor. Nobbs had not reported the attack to police for fear of his sexuality being discovered. Ah, uh, okay. Contrary to the prosecution claims, the defense counsel asserted that Nobbs' testimony reflected Dennis's rational self being unable to control his impulses. The fact that Dennis had selected a university student as a potential victim was at odds with the prosecution's claim that Dennis intentionally selected rootless males whose disappearance was unlikely to be noted. So they, I mean, really, both sides are pretty smart. Yeah, 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 arguing. yeah, yeah. But a college kid could, I mean, you could go a while. Or anybody would say you're missing. True. Especially if you're from out of, you know, you don't yeah, live in the city. Yeah. You're going or to you don't have a roommate. Immediately after the testimony of Nobbs had concluded, Carl Stoddard took the stand. Oh, here's Stoddard. To recount how in May 1982, Dennis had attempted to strangle and drown him before bringing him back to life. Yep. Stoddard's voice frequently quivered with emotion as he recounted how Dennis had repeatedly attempted to drown him in his bathtub as he pleaded in vain for his life to be spared. And how he later awoke to find Dennis's mongrel dog licking his face. On several occasions, the judge had to allow Stoddard time to regain his composure. Mm -hmm. The evidence provided by Stoddard was not included as part of the indictment against Dennis, oh. as his whereabouts were not known at the time until after the indictment had been completed. Okay. All right. Detective Jay then recounted the circumstances of Dennis's arrest and his claim, matter of fact, conf uh, calm, matter of fact confessions. Yeah. Before reading to the court several statements volunteered by Dennis following his arrest. In one of these statements, Dennis had said, quote, I have no tears for my victims. I have no tears for myself, nor are those bereaved by my actions. That's pretty plain as day yeah. right there. Yeah. Jay admitted it was unusual for anyone accused of such horrific crimes to be so forthcoming in providing information. And it is. It is. That is weird. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's going above and beyond what most people would do. Yeah. And Jay, he conceded upon questioning by defense counsel that Dennis not only provided most of the evidence against himself, but also encouraged the discovery of evidence which could contradict his own version yeah, of events. Yeah, exactly. He hung himself. Right. Following Jay's testimony, uh, D.S. Chambers recited Dennis's formal confession to the court. The testimony included graphic depictions of ritualistic and sexual acts that he had performed with his victims' bodies, his various methods of storage of the bodies and body parts, his dismemberment and disposal of the body parts yep. and the problems that decomposition, particularly regarding colonies of maggots, yeah. had afforded him. <laughs> Several jurors were, jurors were visibly shaken throughout the testimony. I wonder why. I can only imagine. Yeah. Sheesh. Others looked at Dennis with incredulous expressions on their faces as Dennis listened to the testimony with apparent indifference. So you got jurors who are freaked out by this, and, yeah. and he's just sitting there like, yeah. Just unaffected. Well, he lived it. He's probably reliving his mind in his head right there. He's probably getting hot and bothered. Probably. Reliving it. Yep. Which is crazy. 
But you know, back in those times, man, I mean, this, this is all new stuff to a lot. This is these crimes are kind of new to these people. So, right. Yeah, it is it is shocking that somebody would do this. Two psychiatrists testified on behalf of the defense. Okay. The first of these, James McKeith, began his testimony on October 26th. McKeith testified as to how, uh, though a lack of through a lack of emotional development, uh, Dennis experienced difficulty expressing any emotion other than anger. Okay, that's not right. But they also talked about a sexual arousal with bodies and how there must be some kind of mental issue going on there. Yeah, and that that should reduce his responsibility for the murders. Oh, okay. Yeah, he okay. said that like, oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. Oh, yeah. Dude, anytime you start throwing psych, psych stuff into it, dude, it just, yeah. Right. So on here we are, Halloween again. Oh, yeah. The prosecution called Paul Bowden to testify in rebuttal of the psychiatrist who had testified for the defense. Oh. Prior to Dennis's trial, Bowden had interviewed the defendant on 16 separate occasions in interviews totaling 14 hours. Bowden testified that although he found Dennis to be abnormal, he had concluded Dennis to be a manipulative person who had been capable of forming relationship, relationships, but had forced himself to objectify people. Refuting the testimony of McKeith and Galloway, the two other psychiatrists, yeah. Bowden further testified he had found no evidence of maladaptive behavior and that Dennis suffered from no disorder of the mind. Uh, yeah, he does. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. Yeah, there's something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Following the closing arguments of both prosecution and defense, the jury retired to consider their verdict on November 3rd, 1983. Okay. The following day, the jury returned with a majority verdict of guilty upon six counts of murder and one of attempted murder, with a unanimous verdict of guilty in relation to the attempted murder of Nobbs. Croom Johnson sentenced Dennis to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. Seems a bit, uh, seems a bit light. Well, it, well it, I, I think a lot of their, I don't, well, they don't do death penalty cases in Europe. Right. So, yeah. It, I mean, you got a parole, parole hearing in 25 years. I mean, he's going to get out, but. True, true. Because it just depends who shows up. Yeah. So now he's in prison. And we're to December 1983. Dennis is cut on the face and chest with a razor blade by an inmate okay. named Albert Moffat. Okay. Resulting in injuries requiring 89 stitches. Holy well, Jesus. That's a lot of stitches. That's a whole face. Um, afterward, he was briefly transferred to another prison before being transferred uh, to Wakefield Prison, where he remained until 1990. In 1991, Dennis was transferred to a vulnerable prisoner unit at Full Sutton Prison upon concerns for his safety. He remained there until 1993 when he was transferred to Wh Whitemore Prison, again as a Category A prisoner, and with increased segregation from other inmates. So he must have been getting threats or something. Well, you think about it. Who were his victims? Some of them were minors. True. Yeah, and we know other inmates do not like it when you, no, you mess don't. with minors. So if, if, if that's the case, I get why he was probably threatened. Yeah. The minimum term of 25 years imprisonment to which uh, Dennis was sentenced in 1983 was replaced by a whole life term oh. by Home Secretary Michael Howard in December 1994. This ruling effectively ensured Dennis would never be released from prison, a punishment he accepted and declined to appeal against. So he agreed with it. So apparently they got this thing over there where the home secretary yeah, can just be like, you know what? Now, nah, yeah, life in it. prison. Let's change it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I guess he didn't. He was like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess he's fair with it. Crazy. In 2003, Dennis was again transferred to full Sutton prison where he remained incarcerated as a category A prisoner. In the prison workshop, Dennis translated books into Braille. Seems an odd thing. Seems an odd thing. He spent much of his free time reading and writing and was allowed to paint and compose music on a keyboard. He also exchanged letters with numerous people who sought his correspondence. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot How of people that sought his correspondence. Weird. How weird. On May 10th, 2018, Dennis was taken from Full Sutton Prison to York Hospital 
after complaining of severe stomach pains. Uh-oh. He was found to have ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, mm. which was repaired, although he subsequently suffered a blood clot as a complication of the surgery. Our friend here, Dennis Nelson, died on May 12th. A subsequent post-mortem examination revealed that the immediate cause of Dennis's death was pulmonary embolism of the retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Yeah. I'm yeah. a moron. I don't know medical yeah, terms. It's all right. I would, I would get on WebMD, but <laughs> I don't know how to spell it. Dennis's body was cremated in June 2018. The service was held with only five mourners present. Oh. Including three prison officers and the individual with whom Dennis had corresponded while in prison. No family members were present at the service. I wonder why. In line with Ministry of Justice policy, Full Sutton Prison paid 3,323 pounds toward the cost of his funeral. And his ashes were later handed to his family. Oh, so they actually did pick up his ashes. I guess. Wow. Well, surprised. It says they were handed to his family. Did they come pick it up or did they show yeah, up on the family's yeah, door? Yeah, yeah. These, here, these here, are the worst. We've been holding on to him for six months. Here he is. Yep. Take him. We don't want him. You know what time it is? We don't have anybody. We don't. I know. I'm not getting excited anymore. I think you should get excited, though. Like I do get excited, but then it's like, hmm. We get really excited when we get somebody, though. I know. Man, we need somebody. We need you. We need you, 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 and you, and you, and you. <laughs> and your friend. Tell your friend. Yeah, tell your friend. And go your friend. To, go to twomurdermorons.com. Sign up to play the Wheel of Death. It ain't going to hurt you. Yeah. The worst that's going to happen is you're not going to win anything. The best that's going to happen is you're going to get a free t-shirt, a free hat, a free yeah, membership, something, something yeah, free. Yeah. And you don't, you don't really even have to be present. We just do it over the phone if yeah, you want. Yeah, we just like FaceTime you basically. Yeah. And you get to be on our show. Yeah. And all 129 subscribers will see you when you're on the show. Yeah. And you get to win something. And we really like playing it. We really like having the wheel up here. Yeah. So please, twomurdermorons.com. Sign up. Sign up. Yep. Why not? Right? You don't have to spend any money. Yeah. It's free. Yeah, it's free. All yeah. you got to give us is like your first name. Well, you can give us your full name if you want. Yeah. You could make up a name. Yeah. You give us a false name. You can tell us you live in a false state. Okay. Give, yeah, give us your email address. Yeah. Give us your phone number. We're not going to sell that same buddy. We're not going to post it anywhere. We're just nope. going to use it to call you or email you and say, hey, you want, you know, if we draw you out, yeah. we're gonna, hey, you want to come on here? You can still say no at that point. Yep. Which we've had happen. Well, actually. Hey, we've had that happen. so excited. Yeah. I saw someone signed up and I was like, yes, we're going to get to do it. And then I was like, hey, you know, would you like to? And they're like, no, nah, nah, I changed nah, my mind. Changed my mind. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. It. I get it. Not get everybody it. wants right. to yeah. be on yeah. camera. Yeah. But please. Head there, sign up. Yeah, sign we'd up. love to play with some people. While you're there, you can buy a shirt. Yeah, you can do all that stuff yeah, too. Yeah. If you uh, enjoyed this episode and you like to support the show, head to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. You can become a member for as little as $3, $3 a, a month. month. Get bonus episodes. We do two bonus episodes a month every yep. other Friday. We've got some excellent ones up. Well, we're up to nine or 10 of them now. Yeah, it should be. You get yeah. instant access to. Plus, you get other cool stuff like being a producer and yep. all that good stuff. So check out buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. Yep. And you buy can also coffee. and buy us coffee. Buy some merch. Yep. Buy some merch. You could. We got hoodies. We got hats. We got t-shirts. We got undies. Yes, we got undies. We got puzzles. Special undies. Special undies. Yep. You'll have to just go check them you have out. To go check it out. There's something very special about very, them. Very, very special. But uh, two murder morons.com slash merch. Or if you're watching, scan the QR code on that screen. You got it. And as always, make sure you subscribe, yes. like, no matter, smash whatever button that is. Whatever platform yeah, you're using. Whatever you're doing. Do all the little free things for us that yeah. help promote the show to other listeners so we can get the yeah. word out and get more people tuning in. Yeah. It'd be awesome. Yeah, so it's just not like my my kids looking at me on TV. Right. Good job, Dad. Yeah, do a good job, Dad. <laughs> oh, Better man. I think of that. Okay. So uh, we also have to give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. So we uh, heavily read from and researched uh, the Wikipedia, ar Wikipedia article and related articles on Wikipedia for Dennis the Kindly Killer Nelson. Yep. We didn't, Even, do, we didn't do Google today. We didn't do Google today. But I do want to say this was such a long story. We had to split into two parts. Yes. And there is even more on there to read 
about Dennis. We just don't have enough time to do that many shows. That yeah, this would have turned. This could have, honest to God, could have been a four parter if we would have included every single detail yeah. I found. So if you want to know, if you're into this, you know, we'll put a link in the description. You can go there and find that article and all the related ones. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that was that's Dennis, kooky dude, man. Yep. Good time. <laughs> Good time. Yeah, good time, but yeah. Well, yeah. We have a good time here. We have a good time telling the story. Yeah. And we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, leave us a comment. See, we didn't say that. Yeah, leave us a comment. Tell us ask, how you feel. Yeah, yeah so ask us a question about it. Something. Yeah. Say hi. Say yeah. what's up. Just tell leave us a comment. We like to see those and respond to those. Yeah. Nice. Tell us what that medical thing was that we don't know is. <laughs> don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> like a moron. Yeah. Yeah, our, yeah, we're only subject to a few things in life yeah. that we know. Well, we will have another crazy, kooky, and insane story for you next Wednesday. Yes. So make sure you tune in, and we will see you all next Wednesday. Thanks for watching. See you guys. Bye, everybody.